Good evening. It is uh, today's uh, Tuesday, October 8th at 6.30 p.m. We are the Olentangy Schools Board of Education. This is a regular meeting. Uh, I'll call the meeting to order. Ms. Hatfield, please call the roll. Mr. Bartz? Here. Mrs. Fiesel? Here. Mr. King? Here. Mrs. Patrick? Here. And Mr. O'Brien? Here. Uh, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I'll uh, entertain a motion to approve the agenda as written. So moved. I'll second. Second. Discussion on the agenda? Nope. Please call the roll. Mrs. Fiesel? Yes. Mr. Bartz? Yes. Mr. King? Yes. Mrs. Patrick? Yes. And Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Thank you. All right, we'll have our first presentation. It's the Military Family Committee, uh, the mission and purpose. Becky Dauber from Soda Ridge and Ashley Peterson from Liberty Tree. Yes. Right. And, and Dr. Dr. Lewis from Hyatt's will be joining them also. So. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Michelle Lewis from Hyatt's Middle School, and I'm the military family liaison and a teacher there. And um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the Military Families Committee. Second Lieutenant Jason Durrell, um, who can't be here this evening because he's at officer training, is a school counselor at Liberty Tree, or not Liberty Tree, Liberty Middle. Um, he noticed a student one day had a National Guard um, placard name on the, on the um, notebook and he just realized all of a sudden, hey, there's military kids around here that I need to be helping. So he became very involved, started to look into what he could do to support military kids. Um, from that point, he became involved with the MIC-3, which is the Military Interstate Children's Compact Commission. The compact is an agreement between all 50 states and the District of Columbia that gives military kids certain rights when they have a permanent change of station from location to location, and it also helps them with placement and extracurricular activities. He also became involved with the Purple Star Advisory Board, which I am proud to say that we have 14 of the 191 schools of our schools are Purple Star schools, which means they're military friendly. So all of this he became involved in it. He also became involved in what's called the RISFAC, which is the Regional Inter-Service Family Assistance Committee. And that is a regional group um, based off the ISFAC, which is the state level, and it's a, a meeting place where people who have interest in the military have support ideas, all different types of committees meet to share. And our committee is a natural progression from that, because the ISFAC is the state level, the RISFAC is the regional, and then our military families committee is the local level. And in fact, it's a very unique committee. Um, we're the only one in the state that I know of at this point, and it's something that um, a lot of other districts are looking to model off of. Our committee started in August of 2017 when Jason sent out an email and wanted to see if anybody was interested in meeting to see what we could do to help kids. He was overwhelmed by the response. In our first meeting, we had um, somebody from Ohio National Guard Family Readiness share resources. We had military family liaisons such as ourselves. We had community members, and it was just a fantastic event, and it has just kept rolling from that point. Um, we get national groups such as Military One Source, um, Morale, Welfare, and Recreation come in and share, and we're able to take that information back to our individual schools. So I'm going to pass the mic to Becky. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of background information. I'm Becky Dauber, teacher, fourth grade, um, Sayota Ridge Elementary School. Um, so th since September 11th, 2001, there have been over 18,000 Ohio National Guard members that have been deployed um, to the, for the global war on terrorism. Altogether, that's about 60,000 Ohioans have actively served their nation away from home. Um, we do not have an active base here in Columbus. We have reservists based in Columbus. Um, approximately 34,000 students in Ohio are members of military families. Um, this means that they are frequently moving um, that their family is separated um, and that they have some reintegration issues when families or family members um, come back from being deployed. Um, part of the thing that military children experience is this long time 
long, um, excuse me, long period of separation. Um, their family members come back with different PTSDs or injuries. Um, and so what we are trying to do as a committee is to provide that support for the children all the way up to the high schoolers and actually even to our staff members. We have quite a few staff members that are either in the service or are spouses of service members um, or actually some of us are old enough to have children in the military. Um, so I think that that is basically why we are here is to ask for our committee to become a district approved committee. Um, we feel that what we are doing is, is pretty important. Um, Ashley is going to speak about some of our events and activities that we have done. So coming up on Veterans Day in the month of November, all of the high schools have a Veterans Appreciation Night at their football games. Many have already happened, if not will be happening in the coming weeks. And we all have events at our schools to support veterans and our military kids, especially Hyatt's has their big event, Living History Day. We also have basketball games that are now per the Ohio High School regulations that will be honored for Veterans Day for military families for that as well. And then our committee is always looking for ways to support our kids. And we're hoping this year to have a district-wide event for all Liberty and uh, the entire district, Berlin, everything together at one central location. We just have to figure out how to make that happen. And now Becky's going to talk <laughs> again. So we're just wrapping it up. Um, so we just want to say that, you know, we are here basically to um, find out if we, if, how to become a district approved um, committee. Um, we want to be able to raise funds for um, military families. We also want to be able to provide a way for us to have these activities for children and their families. Right now, um, Kelly and myself and Michelle and Ashley are all um, have either children or spouses that are in the military or have retired from the military. And I think that we have all been a, a part of the pain and the suffering, yet also the joy of that happens when you have somebody close to you in the military. So that's what we're here tonight for. Um, let us know what we need to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I would defer to Mr. Ray on how I guess we need to determine the superintendent's committee or board committee, mm -hmm. most likely the superintendent's mm -hmm. committee. Or what about a sponsored organization? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There would there, be like three options, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. We'll follow up and make sure that happens. Okay. What are your recommendations? Thank you. Yeah. By tomorrow. Thank you, Chief, for that. thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you to you and your families for your service. Mm -hmm. All right, the next presentation is the uh, <coughs> professional development update, Vince Tatilio. Slides come up. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the time. It's good to see you, and um, I'll try to keep this short, but once our slides get loaded up here, we can. Perfect. Okay. Great. So um, again, my name is Vince Dottilio. I'm the supervisor of professional learning. <clears throat> this is my second year in kind of transitioning into a K-12 role that oversees and, and works to make sure that our teachers are growing and learning um, and, and keeping up with, with that, that rate and pace as we grow as a district. So the first thing we think about in terms of maximizing student learning, for me, comes to maximizing teacher learning. I think the two are closely connected to one another and that's sort of the challenge we're tasked with is we have lots of great teachers um, who are craving lots of learning and we have to figure out a way to create a system that helps them continuously grow and get better year in and year out. So our system, which I'm here to kind of explain uh, today, is pretty similar to what it's been in the past but we keep tweaking it to make it better. It really has four parts to it that we use to make sure that our teachers are continuously growing. The first one is our district professional development days, which I feel like are really, really the backbone uh, of our teacher learning. And that's really where we help all of our buildings sort of attach themselves to our district focus, which I'll talk about what that is later on in the presentation. But these are really days that we're training principals and staff members now on sort of training the trainer model, having them come in and work with us, and then uh, letting them go back to their building and design some professional learning around that idea that, that really meets the needs of their teachers. So um, those three days are really important. Um, we just had one day. We're planning for the second one right now. 
Um, the second part of it is building level professional development. Even, even though we have a district focus, we always are encouraging buildings to adapt that or make, flex that a little bit to meet their building needs also. And some of those, those district PD days have some building focused time in them, but also that's staff meetings, that's other time that staff are getting together to work on the goals that are in their building CIPs. Um, teacher collaboration, which might be the most important part of all of this, is that time that teachers are allotted throughout the week to have that job embedded professional growth. Um, and we continue working on how to maximize that time. Uh, we know it's super important. Um, and we really believe that that is the key to not only a successful building, but also um, it's great PD for new teachers we have to get placed on great teams who have a great collaborative environment. The fourth part, which is a very unique Olin Tangy part, which is something to be very proud of, uh, is our Professional Development Academy. It's another huge part of my job is recruiting staff members to teach courses at night, partnering with universities, which we'll talk about at the end, to, to really offer high quality professional learning opportunities uh, here in our district. So you don't particularly have to go out and spend a ton of money or um, you know seek out great professional development. You can take it here at night. I mean, there was a full class of 30 people up there that just let out. And this is a nightly, nightly thing here. And it's pretty amazing. Uh, don't think that goes on in very many districts. And uh, it, really, it really echoes kind of this craving for learning that we have. And teachers are able to really select things that they're interested in at that level. So when these four are all working together, that's kind of the way the system works. And we really feel like that helps our teachers grow. And it's what makes us great. So where have we been in the past? Just a little survey data for the last four years now, we've been kind of asking the same questions of staff to try to see if we're trending in the right direction. We feel really good about what we're doing. Um, and the data is, uh, is, is showing that also, that you know these, all these numbers are, are up from last year, um, some of them more than others. But these are three areas that I'm particularly proud of. One is just our base level. Do you feel like you've grown professionally? Each year, every staff member, we have to work to grow them professionally. Um, and 95% is pretty, pretty good. And you know, there's that, that number continues to creep up each year. The 70% felt that professional development brought lasting changes to their teaching. That's sort of the, the pinnacle, right? That if what we can do really drives a lasting change to what's happening in the classroom. So I always would love that number to be higher, but also we're proud of that and that continues to r rise. This is a newer measure that we've been asking, um, trying to make sure that every building uh, is clear on where we're headed as a district. So we're kind of asking people some questions about how clear the, the image is and how clear the vision is. And last year, uh, this was the first year we asked that question though, that 85% of staff felt it was very clear in their building of where we were headed, which we know when, that's, when, when that piece is in, in, in play, we're a lot likely to be successful with our professional learning. So this year, our district focus, uh, we're sort of in the habit now of going into like three to five year cycles. The reason that is, is because the feedback that teachers give us is we don't want to focus on something different each year. We don't want to jump from initiative to initiative. We want some time to sink in and sort of think about these things. So the last four to five years was really around the concept of meaningful work in the classroom. Um, and we, we explored that, and we dove into it, and then it just naturally kind of morphed into a discussion more around relationship building with teachers last year, which sort of led us to uh, these social emotional learning competencies, which are, you know, this is, this is a big thing right now in education and really looking at some of the dispositions and, you know, they used to call them soft skills. They're no longer really soft skills. They're really important. Um, and how we can foster those through our instruction in the classroom and how it's not another thing to do. It's how we do things with kids. So these five competencies are sort of what make up um, our vision for social and emotional learning. And we decided not to just dump this on people and dive into all five. What we decided this year was to pick a specific skill that wove itself in and out of those competencies. And that skill is self-regulation. Uh, we've talked about this a bit in the past. Um, there's a lot of research about an individual and student's ability to regulate their thinking, their emotions, and behavior that lends them to be more successful. So it's really about developing strategies for teachers to implement into the way they teach that ask students to goal set, to monitor their progress towards goals, to identify when they're off course or on course and sort of self-correct. Um, and the question that's driving our learning this year, we always try to have a question that really is driving the conversation and that is how might we step back 
to move forward. So we're using that question as a way to remind ourselves that stepping back from situations, reflecting, um, seeing things for how they are is, is a good practice, not only as professionals, but also that we'd like to see in our students. So just a couple highlights from PD Day 1 to show you how this looks. Um, we, the way we run this now is we try to model strategies that not only enhance adult, adult learning, but also can find their way directly back to the classroom. So this is just an example. We uh, developed this learning opportunity called Best Selfie. It was really an idea for each building to think about what their best self looked like, what they looked like as their best self. And there's a lot sort of in this literature about people's ability to see or visualize their best self. Um, and, and when you're able to do that, you can kind of goal set and work towards that. So each building created these, these kind of selfies of their own building to kind of guide their work throughout the year. And it's a great picture of my old coworker, Anthony Elkins at Cheshire, kind of laying on the ground with his staff around him doing the work. So that's pretty cool. Um, we also showed some really practical ways to incorporate journaling, reflection, and goal setting into your classroom. So these are these tiny success journals that people created for short-term goal setting, um, getting students to set one to two day goals for themselves or three to sometimes more manageable with younger kids. Um, and our staff here at Orange High School, again, these are high school teachers diving into this, this idea, which is also great to see um, some examples of their work. And then finally, just some of the meaning making we've been doing around what self-regulation is. And really, instead of telling people what these things are and just kind of dictating, here's what this is, really getting them to explore what they think it means and how it relates to their practice is really important. So we just had a, actually our first planning meeting for day two today, and we're kind of continuing down that path. So where we're headed, just really quick, uh, we're going to continue this focus, I believe, over the next three to five years and find interesting ways to really look at how we teach matters, how, how we instruct students develop some of these dispositions. So it's not another thing I'm doing. It's how I teach my content that is going to teach some of these lessons. Um, some other really exciting projects and things that are going on that I want to highlight. One is uh, our PBL Out of the Gates, project-based learning Out of the Gates partnership with Otterbein. This is the last year of our grant, three years in a row we've been sending teachers along with a potential student teacher to do PD together. So they're learning about project-based learning together and then the teacher is being placed in their classroom after that. It's a really cool, I hope the grant gets renewed. It's a really great idea where like pre-service teachers and seasoned veterans are also learning together and there's been some really powerful partnerships that have developed from that. Character Lab is a new partnership that we've developed. This summer we started this partnership. Angela Duckworth who kind of penned the, the literature about growth mindset. She's pretty famous out in the education world, has created a research entity out of Pennsylvania University um, that is interested in improving the science and practice of character development in schools. So our eighth grade, um, some of our eighth grade teachers are partnering with them this year and we're looking at kind of how that's gonna go and, and kind of increasing that over time if it works for us. This one, the next one I'm personally very interested in, uh, our work with Project Zero from Harvard, which I've talked about here before. Um, we have about 20 teachers who are part of a grant that is a combination of Harvard and the Columbus Museum at, of Art around creating, um, cultivating creative and civic capacities. And this is a research grant around how do you teach students the dispositions of problem solving and how do we teach students to use creative thinking and imagination to solve the problems of their community. So this is a program we have teachers from, I think all four high schools and then all the way down to some first grade teachers who are involved in this. So that's just started, really exciting stuff. Um, the museum is sort of at the forefront of the work on creativity in Columbus right now and a lot of districts are starting to get on board. The last part is one thing we always want to talk about and celebrate is our in-district conference think tank. I mean last year we were you know, up above 300 teachers in the summer for two days with us. We're always starting the planning and getting excited about that. Our teachers really love that. And it's a great way. We always say it's the, fin it's the finish line and the starting line for our PD each year. So I could talk forever about it, but that's sort of the overview for this year. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I, I have any questions. How many, how many cl classes are you offering oh, throughout the year? I had that written down. Yeah, so, so <laughs> last year we offered over 120 classes, which that's kind of, it's a lot yeah, when you think is. about it. And then over 2,000 participants in those. And one of the ways we really increased that number is we encourage teachers to take the class back to their building and teach it in their building or at their building. So I work with kind of 
you know, helping them facilitate that, but it takes away some of the travel to here or childcare. So we have d multiple versions of the same class being taught in different buildings. Yeah. I, well, I'm excited to hear about the um, character lab. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that sounds really neat. And um, I think it could go over really well when mm -hmm. you, you know, take it down into the school level. We had a guest speaker, parent, parent, the PPT did a, something called Unselfie. Yep, mm -hmm. well, that was the book study upstairs too. Unselfie. Oh, I, I, yeah. that was mm -hmm. probably one of the best presentations yeah. I had seen and they talked about that in coming up with a, a motto mm -hmm. for your everybody's family. I could see that, you know, for a particular student or even a building, mm -hmm. but I um, ours is loyalty. And so I always remind my kids that hmm. their strongest trait is that they're loyal and they, they live it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah Unselfie is, is, a, is a book and also some other materials around it. Um, and it's, the other thing we try to do with the OPDA co classes each year is make sure they support the district focus. Yeah. So we try to bring in a, a plethora of classes that directly support that so that teachers are cycling through some of the same ideas from different mm -hmm. angles, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Thank Appreciate you. it. Okay, the next, <coughs> excuse me, next agenda item is the uh, board president's report. Um, <coughs> I thought it'd be helpful to spend a minute on uh, making sure the board's on the same page on kind of where are we in the levy uh, planning process. We've covered it a little bit last week. Um, you know, I'd say through the summer, uh, we spent a fair amount of time kind of exhausting all options, whether it be schedule, optimizing existing space. Uh, we certainly invested uh, time and resources into uh, trying to get state funding fixed, uh, which we were close, but we were not successful. Um, so then we kind of pivoted our, our attention to uh, thinking about uh, what would be necessary to move forward in terms of a levy. We've developed a prioritized list of investments um, that we've covered in the last two meetings around um, what are the things that we need to do to continue to, to keep the facilities up and running as well as meeting the, the growth needs of the district. Um, that list, which we we talked about in the last two meetings, included two elementaries and a middle school. I think importantly, uh, the goal of at least on the capital side is to meet those capital needs with a no new millage uh, bond. So now we pivot to you know, the operating uh, levy. Um, we are kind of feverishly running scenarios to determine the best path forward you know, to meet our operational needs be my expectation that we talk about those scenarios in the October meeting and then in November we get ready to vote. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of keep that expectation in mind. Um, and again, what we're solving for in the operating levy scenarios is not just funding the operations of the capital investments, but also uh, dealing with growth and dealing with uh, keeping programs we want to keep them. Um, and keeping the you know the quality of the experience uh, the best we can. So as we get through the end of this month, you get into November. I think the pre-reads would become increasingly important. Um, so we'll, let's keep on top of our pre-reads, and then uh, we'll keep the dialogue going. Okay. And then I don't, Dave. I know you spent yesterday playing golf. How was how we that? Oh goodness! I have a slide for it in my. Do you? Uh, I thought you would. Let me speak at the end of the. Oh, yeah. By the way, Dave is That's on here. This is oh, Dave. Right. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. It's, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> I just assumed he came in ahead of you. He'd speak yeah. first. Oh, oh, did he? It was a good day. Any <laughs> rumors of cheating on the scores? Now that you're left, no, I'm sorry, I folks. You're I, 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 miss her, I misheard yeah. you. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. King. I guess King. we're on to the superintendent's report. <laughs> so, was it good? It, was, it wasn't too okay, hot. Good. It wasn't too cold. It was just right. <laughs> and how was the turnout? It was pretty good. I, uh, you know, I don't know the actual final numbers. Pam's in the other room, but it, it was a little more than last year, but I don't know the exact Okay, number. good. Because it was at a new location, I just yeah, it was Wedgwood this year, and mm -hmm. we're looking at every couple of years changing to another course in the area. Don't let us keep you. Yes, I apologize. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We have a freshman from Berlin, a Boy Scout in the audience. Very mm -hmm. good. I thought we had somebody. Do, do they, do they, oh, okay. 
AP government? Is that one of your AP Gov students? Welcome all, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna start off with uh, upcoming events. Uh, we're hosting four town halls here in October. You see the dates, uh, Orange Township Hall, Hall Powell City Hall, uh, the North Orange Park Community Room, and then back at Orange Township Hall. So we're gonna give, you know, give us an opportunity to update the community on where we are. Um, Emily and I have been doing staff meetings all throughout the district to talk about our accomplishments and our challenges uh, that lie ahead. Um, I think Mr. O'Brien's president's report was a very good uh, recap of yeah. everything we've been doing since August to try to tee this up. Um, so these will uh, coincide with that and they'll coincide with the, the vote that we have coming up in November. And then we'll uh, launch into the coffee chat circuit from that. So, and then with regards to the OEF golf outing, we did have 17 foursomes attend yesterday. Uh, Mr. McKendrick was the guest speaker. He was an OEF grant recipient. He's a strength and conditioning uh, teacher, health and physical education teacher at Orange High School, and he talked about a really uh, neat project he's working on with uh, uh, monitoring um, the strength and conditioning program they have. He's co-teaching with um, physics teachers, and they're uh, using the, the devices that OEF purchased for them um, to, to, to do that project. Um, it is sad, but I am. This is the last year of the golf outing. We're not going to have it anymore. So, Dave, I don't, Mr. King. I, regardless of what you said, um, reason being is that uh, Mr. Wright wore probably the ugliest pair of shorts ever. <laughs> Seriously. Did you bring a picture? Ever. We. I don't have a picture. Uh, and on top of that, in those ugly shorts, he won. So oh, the lucky I'm, wow. I'm, I'm taking the golf outing. Uh, I'm taking my golf outing and going home <laughs> because. We did not win. We did finish second, though. If you're not first, you're last. Thank you. I, that, thank you for that support, Mr. That's always. Bet that hurts. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, had had uh, Coach Fiesel played better, we would have won. But it was all his fault. He did not play well. Every boat needs an anchor. Yes, every boat needs an anchor. So, um, yeah. This is. Uh, you know, I, we're going to pair up with the general uh, Delaware General Health District to provide flu clinics through all throughout the district. So this is uh, really a good effort from um, from the health district and from our uh, team of nurses to um, get as many of our kids on all their vaccinations and flu shots up to date. And um, uh, accepting the insurance and Medicaid uh, are going to be accepted. So um, I think this will really help make sure our kids stay healthy throughout the flu season. So I'm proud that we're doing that. I know I shared this all with you. I like to share this publicly. Mr. Ball, who's yeah, been he's at, usually here. He, usually he's been coming week, to a couple of our meetings. Well, he went out and participated. He was our only driver to participate in the uh, regional rodeo competition, and he uh, was awarded as the winner for the area. So he'll move on to the next level and then on to the state level. So we're uh, Looking forward to Kevin continuing to do well in that. He's, he's just a great great driver and a great guy, so very proud of him. And then uh, just two quick agenda items to note. Uh, there is one uh, retirement on our um, list, uh, Jennifer Moore from Shanahan Middle School. Um, typically a teacher will resign or retire now um, so that they can uh, kind of not have to go through their final evaluation process. So if they get their uh, resignation in, retirement resignation in before uh, December 1st, we will accept it and it's effective at the end of the year. And then there's a, a approval of design services from Mooney Nolan uh, for $89,000 as the stadium locker room project at Liberty is continuing to move forward. All of the money from this project is privately donated funds. Uh, there's gonna be a combination of um, privately donated funds, a grant that, we, uh, that they got from the Delaware County Finance Authority, um, and then uh, athletic department funds that are from gate receipts that are you know, accumulated over time and Liberty. Um, Mr. Meeker has been targeting this project for a number of years and has been uh, working with the boosters to raise money and uh, and then set aside gate receipts to uh, fund the project. So as this comes forward, all of the money from this project all, uh, will be privately funded, no district funds. So with that, there's our long list of important dates coming ahead. We. Uh, here we are already end of next week is the end of first quarter and we say I know I say it all the time but just that first year just seems to fly by but already one quarter down 
And uh, I'm sure you're aware we did have a, a delay today for the, for the fog. Um, I was highly appreciative of the picture someone uh, tweeted at me of crystal clear conditions in downtown Powell at 5 a.m. But when we made the call, uh, Mr. Meyer and uh, uh, Mr. Fetty and I were uh, out driving the roads. Um, Mr. Wright obviously celebrated too much from his victory at OEF because he didn't answer the call and slept in. He was in his own fog. <laughs> But anyway, um, I'd like to remind people, though, is that with 95 square miles, when we have these weather conditions, the conditions throughout the district are very diverse. And um, as it turned out, uh, at 5 o'clock, it was a little dicey. But by 7 o'clock, it got even worse. Yeah. So yeah, I think it was a mm -hmm. good call, Mr. Meyer. So with that, any questions? Any questions, Mr. Reed? Thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Hatfield, the treasurer's report, please. <laughs> yes, please. Good evening. Um, so I wanted to provide you with a couple of updates um, from our department. Uh, currently, we have our biometric screenings going on across the districts for staff. That is a part of our wellness program that focuses in on this, the staff um, needs. And the biometric screenings provide um, folks an opportunity to come in, have their basic health numbers checked. Um, so they understand what their health risks are and can follow up with their PCPs and providers if need be um, and also get reference to a PCP or, or um, provider if they need it. Um, and with that then we continue throughout the year to have educational meetings, um, physical fitness classes, et cetera, to help support the staff and their needs to stay healthy and fit in the classrooms. Um, so just wanted to say thank you to Mount Carmel and our staff who have been facilitating those and sometimes they're up at 6.30 and sometimes they're up at 10, out of the building at 10 o'clock. So they've been running um, two biometric screenings a day for the last couple of weeks and we hope to have everybody visited by the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, and then just in a brief summary of what uh, we've been working on with the five-year forecast, of course, we'll do the first reading here in a few moments. Uh, we've been meeting with our facilities or finance and audit committee I go to the facilities meetings too i apologize <laughs> i say the names interchangeably way too often <laughs> um, but with our finance and audit committee we have been reviewing the forecast and the details and assumptions within it um, we've also been having discussions about a 10-year operating plan um, thinking about um, not only where we're landing with the forecast, the assumptions that we've included, but what does that mean for the district in the future? So when we meet with the board on October 23rd, we will have some more information about that 10-year outlook and about millage um, that we're looking at in terms of operating needs to go with the package that we are um, putting together for the next levy cycle. Um, with that, again, we will talk about bond. We will talk about the items and components and finalize what we would like to put in the bond package. Um, that would be a no new millage cost to the um, voters. And then talk about permanent improvement funds. Um, as we have said, we've gone through the list of the items that were presented um, by Mr. Gordon and Mr. Sexton and look at where our funds are and where we are currently and how we can sustain those projects and those needs moving forward. So we'll compile all of that and have a, a comprehensive um, view for you guys at the next meeting on all of that. In terms of what we have for the board action items this evening, uh, we do have some meeting minutes that we bring forward um, for each meeting for poor Ohio revised code. Um, and then we also have donations. So we always want to make sure that we recognize our community members for their in-kind donations, whether it's hours or support that they're giving to our groups, um, but also for their financial donations. This evening, we would <coughs> like to recognize um, the over $2,300 for iPads for the art room um, given to Walnut Creek Elementary by Walnut Creek PTO. We had a $5,000 classroom supply um, donation for from Johnny Cake Corners PTO to that elementary school. We have $500 for Eagle News Studio from the Hyatt's Middle School PTO to that middle school. 
Um, an interesting a palette of tools valued at approximately $8,000 from Milwaukee Tools to Berlin High School Industrial Tech Department. And then just over $2,500 towards a boys basketball coach from Olentangy Orange Athletic Boosters to the school district for that purpose. So again, we thank our community for all of their donations um, and appreciate their continued support. Um, with that, I will take any questions that you might have in regards to what's on the agenda tonight. Thank you. And we do have public participation, is that correct? Yes, we do. We have public participation requests from Dustin Weatherby. Um, Dustin, we would ask that you would join us at the podium, please. And then I'll read a, read a short statement for you. Um, each statement should be, shall be limited to five minutes duration unless extended by the presiding officer. Um, and for the record, we would ask that you state your name and address um, and then tell us what you would like to, to, to present to the board, please. Hi, uh, my name is Dustin Weatherby. My address is 1350 West 6th Avenue, Columbus, Ohio, 43212. Um, so I'm, I have a company uh, entitled Sculpt Decor LLC. And Sculpt Decor LLC is a company where I specialize in creating live art demonstrations, custom public sculptures, and uh, and also um, animatronic or robotic displays. Uh, I've got over 20 years of experience in, in sculpting, so um, that's one thing that I'd like to share with, with students. Um, over the last several years, I've been going to different schools and conducting these live art demonstrations, which usually consist of like carving wood or ice, uh, sometimes pumpkins, and it's, it's it gets a great reception from the students and staff. The staff typically says things like, this is like taking a field trip that comes to us, you know, and, um, and other things like that. And I often take breaks during these live art demonstrations to, to explain the tools that I use and the processes and things to try to, try to help uh, educate the students with it. Um, and I think that art creation itself is often overlooked in its ability to foster critical thinking and problem-solving skills. So I just kind of want to highlight the importance of it in schools. Um, being a professional sculptor, you know, I, I, I deal with it every day. People are like, what do you what do? You do? You know, and I, I tell people I can make anything out of anything because um, I use just in about any type of material, steel, metal, wood, um, et cetera. So uh, in the past, couple years I've done these demonstrations at New Albany High School, um, Upper Arlington Jones Middle School, and several Hilliard schools. And I actually used to coach wrestling at Olentangy High School here. And I thought, why not come up and, you know, mm -hmm. offer it to Olentangy schools? So um, if you have any questions about any of any of this uh, information, or you might consider it for any of these schools, um, my contact information is uh, sculptdecor.com is my email address, or I'm sorry, sculptdecor.com is my website address. My email is sculptdecor at gmail, uh, same spelling, S-C-U-L-P-T-D-E-C-O-R. Um, and then I have, if you search sculptdecor all in one word, I want to remind you too. Um, if you search on YouTube and Facebook and all that, I have plenty of videos of, of Often I do time lapse videos that I produce for the school itself afterward to share with the students because nobody wants to sit there for five hours straight and watch a carving or something. But if they can watch it in two minutes, you know, with their attention spans, it's it's great for them. So, um, but yeah. So thank you for the time, uh, and please reach out to me if you have any questions. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I have questions. If you want yeah, questions. can can I can I ask like what? Like at New Albany, so what did you sculpt? Like, what, can you give us an idea? Or at Upper Arlington, what what did you sculpt? And did you leave it there, or is so, it part of the school? Or well, actually, I, I I left each of my sculptures there. But um, at New Albany, I've done two ice carvings for them, um, and then for Upper Arlington Jones Middle School, they actually wanted me to create uh, their mascot, the Golden Bear, and I carved it out of honey locusts. 
uh, wood. And so I was carving there in a live demonstration for two days. And then I took it home and then I finished it, got it all refined so it was very presentable and took it to them. And now they have it on display in their front office. Um, and I think it's going to go in their, I think it's going to go in their uh, new high school yeah. after that's uh -huh. finished. Yeah. Um, and then with, with Hilliard, I had done several ice carvings for them, um, like at elementary schools, and then Hilliard Darby High School last year. And then I did, well, Hilliard Darby, I did three wood carvings for them. And then, um, yeah, and Hilliard Weaver Middle School last year, I'd also done uh, an ice carving for them. So I left all of them there, technically. Mm -hmm. Right. The ice carvings, I'm like not right. really gonna take them home, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, they kept they kept all the wood carvings and they put them on display. So, and I just kind of embarked on this on this going around to schools and and offering this. So, um, seems to be pretty well received. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Do you participate in the International Ice Festival in Plymouth, Michigan? In Frankenmuth? No, Plymouth. Oh yes, I used to. I carved there twice. Mm -hmm. Did you? Three times actually. See, I'm impressed. Yeah, it's international. Right. Right. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. I'm from Plymouth, and so. Well, I, I uh, was on the Eastern Michigan ice sculpting team, so uh -huh. that's where that's where I got into that. So. Well, I have appreciation for it in college. I was at Capitol and uh, did an internship under Gary Ross, who uh, sculpted um, the Bob Feller statue, but uh, I worked on the Governor Rhodes statue that's down the State House. So I was the guy that got to bring clay and jump when Governor Rhodes came with his bodyguards. <laughs> um, but so I have an appreciation for that. I, you know, believe it or not, folks, I was an art minor in college. So it's very cool. We so. don't believe that. Uh, it is. <laughs> but uh, so I appreciate that. So thank you for yeah. that. Yeah. Thank we, you. we need to connect you with all of our art teachers. Yeah. yeah. Be sure to put you thank in you. Touch with you in there. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Thank yeah, you. Thanks for any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's great stuff. We'll okay. pass it along. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we move to our first discussion item. It's the first reading of the five year financial forecast. Ms. Hatfield. Oh, she's going up to the podium. Come on. Good evening. Um, I'm happy to be back in front of you to discuss our October update to the five-year forecast. Um, when we last talked about being able to update the forecast, we knew that our um, legislators had made a change on the filing requirements. Um, by law, we can wait until November to file this fall update, um, but we wanted to keep it in October to move the conversation and updates that we have regarding our levy planning along in a timely manner that would help us facilitate the resolution passing and all of those compliance issues. So with that, we will start with the May forecast summary. Um, we're gonna look at our revenues versus expenditures, our unre unreserved fund balance and days cash on hand. As you can see from this table, this, the first line represents our revenue versus expenses. So this details what our revenue versus how we are spending that revenue. Um, our reserves come from when we pass a levy or we have our revenue gain, it kind of sits in our um, account. We take it and make sure that we are investing it as we hold on to it. But then as we work through that levy collection cycle, we tend to have the peak of when the collection is passed and then expending it down over the next cycle. Um, this is part of being locally funded. As a locally funded district, we continue to talk about levy cycles and when, not if. Um, we'll get more into our state funding as we go through the presentation and how that plays into this role. Um, but looking at this chart, we knew in May or talked about in May that we would potentially be looking at um, needing to be on the ballot in maybe 2021 or 2022 for operating dollars. Our policy is to have roughly a month or two months cash balance. Um, and we are at 28 days in fiscal year 2022 as of May. 
So that would indicate that we would probably be on the ballot in 2021 to collect in 2022. <coughs> um, so as we move forward, we're gonna go through each component of the forecast. We'll start with the revenue. So in fiscal year 2020, we have gone through um, several modica modifications to our revenue. Um, as you know, we have had a new biennium budget. State legislators have passed House Bill 166 um, that had new funding components that we discussed in terms of, in terms of growth, student growth mechanism. Thank you. <laughs> um, it takes a look at our average growth that we have had over 2016 to 2019 and issues a $20 per pupil amount to give us growth. They took our normal formula funding and held it flat, gave us those growth dollars. And then actually, I would say about three weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago, Auditor Faber released um, an announcement that the student well-being funds were not to be categorized in our five-year forecast, but set aside in a separate fund. So the unrestricted and restricted grants and aid do not reflect those student well-being funds. Um, I believe the Auditor Faber's point of view on that was looking at the biennium budget cycle and not knowing whether or not those student well-being funds would be carried forward into the future. So we have to hold them um, to the side. So you'll see our restricted grants and aid um, is lower than our initial assumptions, but you know, still, <laughs> still slightly more positive than we were in May. Um, by average, we're still only at 6% funded by the state of Ohio. The rest of our funding is coming from taxes of one sort or another. Our general property tax is collections from real estate, whether that's home um, or commercial properties. Public utility is off of our utility companies, think AEP, Delco Water, etc. cetera. Uh, the property tax allocation is actually our homestead and rollback credits that the state of Ohio gives to the district. Uh, they passed a law in early 2000, well, 2013, making it official that as of 2014 forward, there are no longer homestead and rollback credits available to the community members, to the taxpayers. So we still uh, will receive credits um, from the state to us uh, that they issue for those community members, but those will taper down as we continue to move forward and have more levy cycles that come on the books passed after that 2014 date. All of the revenue and financing resources um, are primarily our TIF dollars that we have. Um, we've been very active in having community partnerships over the last several years to make sure that we are inviting to commercial um, development within our community that helps us build our overall tax base and helps reduce the tax burden to our residents who are in the area. So we'll continue to look at those um, opportunities as they come to the district and make sure that they make sense for our overall um, sustainability for the district. <clears throat> Before you move off revenue, mm -hmm. so in the general property tax, is a commercial tax revenue in there as well? Yes, so general property tax is residential, agricultural, and, and um, commercial, yes. Can so class that? one, class two is how it's usually split? referred to. Can we get that split over the forecast period? Um, yes, I can get that for you. I apologize, I don't have it notated, but okay. I can look it up and get it back to you. I have a question as well. On the other financing sources that are coming from the agreements we've made with developers, um, if we, uh, are we collecting at 100% on those agreements? We're not having any issues with any of our developers in those agreements we have? Um, in terms of TIF abatements and yeah, things of that everything nature? Yeah, following along the way it's supposed to, is that? Yes, I don't have any grievances with anyone at this point in terms of collection. Um, what we find is that they are, um, they may be very, optimistic about when the projects will start and how fast the completion of those projects might take place which then delays the collection but in terms of being not being compliant with the agreements in general no i don't have anyone that's outside of those agreements has that former statement where they have some slow down time has that put any strain on your 
budget then with the revenue? Um, if they have some slowdown time, what we do for our forecast is look at what we've been able to collect um, historically and what that percentage rise is and forecast that way. So as new TIFs come on, it adds more than what we expected because we're waiting on that timing to come forward. So we're taking the base of what we had, looking at it as an inflationary increase versus we need to bring Polaris TIF online now, we need to bring um, the Grief Park online now or Creekside or this individual piece um, because to your point, they will fluctuate dependent upon how fast they get um, members in. So I feel that the, all other, those TIF components that we're um, looking at are done on historical valuations so that it's pretty reliable. I understand my question is not to question you or your staff. It's we're preparing for a levy. And no, I understand we that. We want to make sure fine. that, to no, Kevin's point as well, is yeah. we just need to make sure that we're demonstrating to the public that we're on. Well, no, I, board with the I, I think there's a <coughs> case to be made, and I hope the numbers bear it out, that the board has been fairly accommodative to commercial development in an effort to r reduce some of the burden on the residential right. taxpayer. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to see is over time, have we been able to move the needle in mm -hmm. terms of the mix of residential and commercial revenue because <coughs> um, we haven't said no to any commercial development right. yet, mm -hmm. right? And so, and it's mm -hmm. been deliberate in, as a way of trying to diversify away from the personal property taxes. So I'd like to see this mix over time to sure. see if we've had an impact on starting to change that mix. Sure. I think it could be a good um, storyline of the other discussion. Absolutely. And I can pull that information and give it some historical trend as well. Yeah. We can bring that forward to the next discussion if that's okay. Some of the things you've talked about Creekside, mm -hmm. 23 mm -hmm. Corridor, um, mm -hmm. the Polaris, TIF, I mean, 36, 37. Westerville TIF. But, um, all that, that we've been very supportive of. I hope at some point it's going to start to move the needle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, just the, the portion of the land that's already being taxed, it's undeveloped, it was previously undeveloped, is all in that general property tax yes. line already. It's that... Um, it's the incremental growth right. of the valuation. Value. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So we don't lose the base that we started with. We are just looking at the um, abatements on the new construction or the new um, valuation that is added from those projects. So great questions. Are there other questions on this slide before I move forward? Thank you. So just to compare our May um, 2020 estimates versus our current 2020 estimates, um, we will be increasing our revenues by about $3.4 million. Um, 1.8 of that is coming from our real estate um, section about 0.64 percent is class one which again is our residential agricultural and we saw a greater increase in class two a two percent increase in class two um, which falls into that commercial piece uh, we also had delinquency collections come up over our expected percentage by about 1.3 percent so those three component components combined um, led to the 1.8 million dollars in real estate we also had the $691,000 in unrestricted grants and aid. Again, that's our general state funding. Um, we have that estimate based on looking at the ADM growth and how the state counts our students when they update their counts, et cetera. And so this is a slightly more conservative number than we saw in the governor's information that was released when this came out. It's maybe about $300,000 <coughs> difference um, but again, if that trends better or higher, we'll continue to update that in the May forecast. Um, but $300,000 is not truly that significant to the overall budget. Um, and then in our all other revenue, we have about another $600,000 that was in more, that came in more than our previous estimates. And about 200,000 <coughs> of that is interest income and then the various components within that category. So there's lots of different items that are small incremental changes that helped add up to that 600,000. The 3.4 is 
for context is a percentage increase of oh my goodness so if our total budget is, revenue is about 230 million dollars it's just over one percent or right around one percent seconds not earth shattering i mean mm -hmm. as a whole it sounds like wow 3.4 million right. but when you look at the our overall as a whole yeah. right sure. right mean, especially with the 691,000 unrestricted grants and aid which is an increase of 20 dollars per pupil think of it this way people the yeah. private schools got an increase of 45 dollars per pupil <laughs> Yes, I know. We'll we'll continue to push that button when I talk about a risk assessment. Yep. <laughs> um, so on the other side of the forecast, we want to discuss our expenditures and talk about um, anticipated expenditures by category. This chart represents where we are expecting our expenses to come in for fiscal year 2020. It shows the percentage of overall total to the far right. Um, we are anticipating that our um, expenditures have, um, will have some improvements in our um, employee retirement benefits and also in our other objects. And I'll get to those specifics in a moment. Um, I think what's important to understand is when folks take a look at our uh, overall forecast and take a look at the percentage that is next to our personnel and employment and retirement insurance benefits costs they need to understand that we are a service industry um, most of our cost is going to come from staff because that's what we do we have staff on hand to help our students and communities grow so in context it's it doesn't surprise me um, or I think we're on target to be at those higher levels in those two categories. Um, so in general, we are about $2.7 million under expectations with our um, expenditures. Um, the biggest component of this change is the uh, 2.6 million in other objects. And that's being driven by our federal funding. Our IDEA funding came in um, higher than anticipated and we also have higher than anticipated or budgeted for um, in some of our um, other areas of federal funding um, that are causing us to be able to reduce what's in the general fund for our educational service center costs our educational service center provides us with our preschool um, our therapists some of our aides um, and so we are going to take those additional federal funds, we'll apply it to the other objects, and then be able to open up uh, the general fund expenditures in purchase services a little bit so that, that so our people services department is still able to have access to the funds that they had planned to have. So what it's going to do overall is kind of shift um, where some of that falls, but because the federal funding is so much more you'll see a reduction in overall expenditures. The other news that is great to share is a $500,000 um, difference in our medical insurance premiums. As we know, we brought forward the insurance premiums to the board um, to approve a 4% increase over previous calendar year premium rates. And so what we're seeing with the forecast is a proration port of that portion of that. Um, our premium rates run on a calendar year, and so we'll see a part of it now and a part of it in next fiscal year, and so they kind of overlap each, each fiscal cycle as we go through those expenditures. So let's talk about the um, October forecast summary. Again, the chart that we're gonna um, pull up shows our revenue versus expenses, unreserved, fund balances and days cash on hand so this is a good thing as we talked about being a little bit over on our revenue and a little bit under on our budgeting um, it allows us to extend our unreserved cash balance um, I left fiscal year 19 on here just as a reference point now that we are closed and fiscal 19 is an actual versus an estimate um, it gives us that good jumping off point because we landed or we closed fiscal year 19 positively 
Um, we thought we would have revenue versus expenditures would also be in red for fiscal year 19, but it ended up as a positive $4.4 million. And that carries forward um, as we move across the page. I apologize, I just noticed on this that there's a carry down of a <laughs> parenthesis um, that did not show up as I printed it, so I apologize that that kept that down. Um, but really just a formatting error. Uh, the numbers are uh, 24 days increase by 2024, meaning that we have 24 more days of unreserved cash balance. Um, and just as a reminder, fiscal year 2024 was not on the May forecast um, as we add another fiscal year to, in each October update. What was 2023 in May? Because I I'm going to go back. Minus, minus 45. Wait, oh, wait, there we there go. We go. So we went. Minus 29. So for fiscal year 23, okay. we went from minus 29 days to minus five. Minus five. Okay. I thought you asked for revenue versus expenses. So as we continue to have our positive variances, um, it continues to help our forecast get better and continue to build our unreserved fund balance. Um, and we know that that typically has occurred for us forecast over forecast. We're traditionally within 1% of where we thought we would be. So while the dollar amounts may sound um, significant when we talk about millions of dollars, they're not, um, the impact to the overall forecast is around a 1%. Um, just due to the sheer volume and size of the forecast itself. Okay, so I'm going to click through really quickly here and we'll get to the risk assessment. So these categories um, are traditional risk assessment categories in terms of things that we really have to keep an eye on um, from a management and operational standpoint. Our student enrollment, as it very clearly has a significant impact on our staffing, the number of staff that we need to service those students and any additional facilities that we might need. Um, again, our state budget, we've talked a little bit about House Bill 166 and the lack of funding in that bill. Um, and it has a significant impa impact on our levy cycle. Um, you know, state funding doesn't necessarily, it's not enough to keep us off of a levy cycle and because of the lack of funding, it's not usually helping us extend cycles either. Um, and then of course our insurance enrollment and premium rates, because we are self-funded, we continue to take a look at that and make sure that we're monitoring our enrollment, that we're monitoring our premium rates, and we're monitoring our self-insured fund balance so that we know we can cover those costs and any costs that might come up that would be um, above and beyond a typical um, expenditure. We do have stop loss premiums to help handle those one one time claims that are very expensive. Um, currently I think we have about 11 of those on the books so to speak. Those are helping us keep those large um, expenditures out of the claim dollars and going towards our stop loss premium. Um, but all of that is regulated um, and looked at and reviewed as we go through our audit and as we have individual actuary representatives come in and take a look at our fund balances to make sure that we're holding funds appropriately in, in that O24 fund. Now, I had originally thought that in, in lieu of time that we could um, keep some of those risk assessments off of slides. I do have more information for you if you would like to deep dive into some of that enrollment and state budgets. Um, I know there were questions and conversations coming up from board members that we heard about, so we prepared a few extra slides if you would like us to go into further detail. I'm happy Before to do so. One item, and we'll just take it offline. <coughs> I'd like to see the House Bill 264 work, because I see the debt coming through. Okay. But utilities are still growing at 4% a year, and the savings aren't showing up. So I want to understand how that matching is working. Okay. Not. Absolutely, we can put that together. Um, in general, what we see is in our utility line that it continues to go down and we continue to make adjustments to be under budget for that and continue to curtail that utility line. 
um, but we'll pull that out from purchase services so that we can see it not wrapped in with the other components in that category. Are there other questions? Okay, you said you had other yeah. slides. I did. Okay. <laughs> Mike, I wanted to make was, sure. Did that you prepare a slide to show what would have happened to this forecast had Governor DeWine not vetoed fair funding for Olentangy? Absolutely. Funny it's funny you asked that. I appreciate my Mr. Reef being a little bird on my shoulder for this one. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, so we prepared a quick calculation to show what that funding w could have been for Olentangy, um, assuming that if they put that fair funding model in, that it would continue um, past the 22-23 biennium budget into 2024. I find it hard to believe they would put some funding into that magnitude and pull it out that quickly. Um, so I left it in for this, for purposes of our conversation tonight in fiscal year 2024. Um, without keeping in any kind of enrollment growth or inflationary changes, um, I calculated that it would roughly be $14.4 million additional state funding to us in 2022 and held that flat for those three years just as a quick conservative estimate of what it would do to our forecast. Um, as you can see for our state funding, um, unreserved grants and aid, it would almost double it. Just to be clear, when you say fair school funding, you're referring to getting as much money as private school. Yes, that yes. we would so be the getting the, on public. One the, the thousand, Patterson plan was called a fair school funding. That's totally different. One thousand, it would be mm -hmm. getting $1,312 per pupil, mm -hmm. yeah. is, which is what the private schools are getting and in my calculations I just use thirteen hundred dollars just to round it and make it simple for conversational purposes um, this shows what it would be if we put it into our revenue of the five-year forecast um, and as you can see it makes a significant change in our unreserved cash balance how fast we are spending down our reserves and gets us to a positive um, 30 days cash balance in 2023 and we don't hit negative until 2024 so a significant difference for us um, when you look at the amount of 14 million dollars um, that's nearly 3.2 mils of tax dollars that we didn't get so when we talk about our levy planning cycle and what we're asking for in a millage rate we have to think about what we can do to cover that and that's typically why we have a millage rate that's more than five percent because we're missing roughly three to four percent from state funding and so our taxpayers are burdened with helping us make up that difference right. i think you meant mills not percent mm -hmm. uh, yes i'm sorry mills 3.5 mills yeah. oh yeah yeah i mean i i just wanted to point out we would still be on the ballot mm -hmm. yes but we wouldn't be looking at asking our taxpayers for as much money but now thanks to this veto it's back to square one it's mm -hmm. right well, we also shouldn't let the previous administration off the hook either because they vetoed it too oh absolutely no absolutely yeah. right right and you know the state continues to look at it and say that it's you know arguing that it's helping the wealthy and not helping the state overall and that it's too big of a bill um, to the state budget to afford I, you know there's a lot of commentary that we could pull and add to that um, I will just say that you know we tried our best to make sure that we were in front of our legislators to talk about fair school funding plan and changing the funding formula and getting it even across all school districts you know not just one particular item we talked to them about this fair funding model, um, you know, representatives from the school board, Mr. Rafe, myself, and other constituents tried really hard to get in um, to our legislators and communicate what this is doing to us. Um, but again, to your point, the governor of line item vetoed um, the last ditch effort, I would say, for us to try to have more state funding put in place. Um, the last update I had on House Bill 305 
which is the fair school funding model being brought back as a separate bill. Um, that was supposed to have hearings, I believe, sometime this fall and work its way through the process again, but I have not had any updates or any timeline as to when that will be introduced for hearings um, to have those conversations and try to work a better funding model overall for the state. Um, we know that lawsuits have been brought forward before to uh, make the funding plan that we have unconstitutional. It, it's been done multiple times. Um, it's been deemed unconstitutional multiple times, but still the Four funding times. doesn't change. Um, so not giving up hope, but just trying to put context around the efforts that we're making to try to move that needle forward. Well, you know, there, the frustrating thing is there's 27, the, the last calculation in the, in the budget process, there's 27 districts in the state that are in this position that they get less sta state money than uh, private schools. And so the total bill of that to, to fully fund that would have been about $41 million, you know, maybe like two years ago or so. Not a, I mean, really not a significant number. But, but the, the problem we have is, is that all these other districts really don't talk about it as, as much as us no, because they're none not of growing. them are growing. Only New Albany right. is of those 27 in a growing district and they're not growing at the rate we are. So, you know, in Indian Hills or in Upper Arlington or some of those other districts don't face these same challenges because they can spread out their levy ask because they're not growing. And, you know, again, our levy ask is always about two things lack of state funding and growth it's that it's just that simple yep, absolutely um, I think one of the great slides that demonstrates that is just our enrollment trend um, we took a look at putting together a quick um, graphic as to what our trends are doing and again they continue to grow as as Sharon um, discussed when she presented the enrollment from the facilities committee we continue to grow five, 600 students a year. Uh, that's roughly two mils of expense every year for growth. Um, and so that's not gonna, that doesn't seem to be slowing down for us. When we take a look at our community and how far it, we are in terms of maxing out building capacity, you know, with, with changes in zoning, et cetera, we thought we were at 60, it's moving back to 50. Um, and we continue to have conversations, but the growth just doesn't seem to slow down. They're gonna continue to come. So again, to Mr. Rave's point, the continuous growth and lack of state funding is the critical issue that just combines into these, um, this levy cycle campaign that we continue to have to talk about. And I, I just wanna emphasize what you said. You said two mils a year for growth. When we go on the ballot, okay, so we always say, okay, well, We'll go on for next for three years. We'll make mm -hmm. this last three years. So that's six mills then that we need for growth, roughly. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. That's not yeah. like that's not like keeping status quo with right. the expenses that we we have. That's just to keep up with growth. Mm -hmm. Yep. So a product of our own success, um, we continue to have. You know, community members move in, bring their students here. Um, you know, we're very proud of the fact that, you know, as Vince states, with our teachers coming to learn about how to grow their de professional development, when we talk about the students that are getting served, you know, all kinds of opportunities from all of their reading mechanisms, their military connections, you know, this is a great community to live in. Our people keep coming because we have an excellent story to tell. Um, we just have to make sure that we can manage the growth and continue to talk about levy cycles with our community because it's just not going to be funded by the state. We, we have questions. People ask us, people have asked just in the last week, well, why do we, why are we educating students who technically live, they have a, a Delaware address or a Westerville address, their, their homes are in, in those areas. Why are we educating those? Those children are in our school district. School district lines and city lines have nothing to do with each other and so right. then the question was well why don't they take those students why don't these other entities take those students delaware and westerville don't want our students <laughs> because they can't afford our students either what they want is they want our commercial development and we're, we're not going to do that i mean getting it involved in in land swaps anyway is just you don't even want to go go that route mm -hmm. because it, it's just so um, difficult to do we don't want to do it because the first thing they'll look at is hey 
how about this Kroger distribution center right here? Mm -hmm. And that's what we don't want to give up. So I don't want anyone to think that we're seeing growth and we want to like pawn these students off on somebody else because they live in a mailing address that isn't that doesn't say Owen Tangy, it says Delaware or Westerville, because that isn't happening. They don't want them. Well, there is, there is no address that says Owen Tangy. Well, that is true, but people <laughs> think that there is. But, the, the, I mean, the school district lines existed far before oh, far, city. Oh, yes. I, 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 made, I made a prediction that it's up because as Delaware continues to annex south, there may come a time where there are more students living uh, in the Old Tangy Local School District that reside in the city of Delaware mm -hmm. than actually reside in, that attend Delaware City Schools. Yeah, but Delaware City Schools, they don't want our kids. They're going to continue to annex. They, yeah. they, they're, they're, they're growing. They, they have their own growth issues, as does Big Walnut, as does Westerville, well, who's on the ballot. it's impossible to change school district. Problems. Yeah, so I don't even want, don't even think about it. People think, oh, I've got the best idea will give these students away. No. And we're the number one real estate market in the country. Like that used to be Texas. People are coming. We have a good market. Yes, we do have a, a our property valuations continue to rise um, with the exception of that short period in the economic recession in 2008-2009, um, which was catastrophic to a lot of areas. Area, our yeah. valuations continue to grow. Um, they are growing you know, roughly 2% at least year over year. So we're fortunate in that area as well. Again, a product of our own success. Are there further questions that you have about Anything the forecast? Yeah. Nope. Thank right. you. So the next step is? So in, uh, uh, October 23rd, we'll, we'll see some scenarios that we will consider and then vote on in November. Knowing that the bond is no additional millage. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, yeah, right. Correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct. And we will um, to put a um, item on the ballot. We'll have two resolutions that we will have to pass by the Board of Education to make that happen. So there'll be a resolution um, offered November 4th and a resolution offered November 20th to meet all of our filing requirements with the State of Ohio, Ohio Department of Education, Board of Elections, etc. Um, and so the first vote will be um, a resolution um, regarding debt, and the second one will be more about the millage rates itself in November. So this, we still have an opportunity to have those conversations um, by introducing those in October and discussing them and kind of pinning down those numbers at that first meeting in November. Okay. Good. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Give you a minute to sit down. <laughs> we'll roll right into the treasurer action items. So, Ms. Hatfield, if you're ready, could you present your treasurer action items? Yes, please. I would like to present treasurer action items A and B for approval, please. Second. Any discussion? Okay, call the roll. Mrs. Patrick. Yes. Mrs. Fiesel. Yes. Mr. Bartz? Yes. Mr. King? Yes. And Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Rafe, please present superintendent action items. Yes, sir. I present superintendent action items A through D for approval. I'll move. I'll second. Any discussion on the superintendent action items? All right. Seeing none, please call the roll. Mr. King? Yes. Mr. Bartz? Yes. Mrs. Fiesel? Yes. Mrs. Patrick? Yes. And Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Thank you. Now, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. I move. Second, please. I'll second. Again, our next meeting is October 23rd. That's a Wednesday. Is that official? Here? <laughs> it's on the calendar. Okay. It's official for now. Uh, please call the roll. Mr. King. Yes. Mrs. Patrick. Mr. Bart. Yes. Mrs. Fiesel. Yes. And Mr. O'Brien. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.